the, the thing that that kind of like gave me like more motive to do stuff is that I started realizing that a lot of guys that that I grew up with that were locked up when they would see me on TV it gave them some some sort of hope right so then that made me feel good because then they would see me and they'd be like yo man when I was in there you know I would look at it, I was like, that's my boy that's my boy and they'd be proud and that's the thing about the low east side is like we're proud people and we're we're proud of people's accomplishments and we want to bond together we have so much talent out here and it's just like it's just about just like getting it out there. So, you know, I'm just like proud of my people. Ah, like, oh, uh, here's I like this guy. He was, this is what the meter people used to look like at that period of time. Yeah. Like the uniform. Hi, my name is Clayton Patterson. I'm here with uh, Power and Sace, uh, two eminent figures from Lower East Side, well known, people that got up and go. And one day, it probably, I guess it was probably later 80s, I had a call, somebody knocking on my door. Some of the boys from over there selling Hellraiser on Stanton and Ludlow had to have their picture taken with this famous guy that was showing up in the block. Oh my God, he's MTV. He was like everywhere. And I'm thinking, what? Who is this guy? So I go over in the middle of the block. Everybody swarms around to get a picture of this guy. First time. Do you remember what year that was? I don't remember. Was it? I can't remember. I know I used to rock my Afro big. Like it was like really wavy and, and out like to here. And yeah, those guys were impressed anyway, so that was like the big deal. They had to be photographed with power, so that was my first uh, meeting of power, and then we crossed over with Sace here, and it turns out we're to cross over a number of different parts, uh, uh, making the Pope, of course, and different people like that, so we have sort of an underground connection. Actually brings up a couple points, too, of the, uh, the part about uh, where one of my blessings really was, was being able to uh, take all those photographs in front of the door and make that huge collection, because then it expanded beyond the door. But also in talking of you talking about uh, cutting over from different uh, parts of the neighborhood, I think your aunt also had a space above uh, ABC No Rio, yeah. which was also a notorious place in the Lower East Side. Yeah. So we're going from like MP MTV and corporate world into, tell us about the yeah. uh, upstairs from ABC No Rio. I mean, all, this, all of this, like, you know, me being able to, you know, use my, my stories and, and, and writing, all of that stems from things that I've seen, things that I've experienced. You know, as a, as a child, I, I, I remember being like about maybe six years old, seven years old, anywhere from six to eight and hanging out with my cousins. And my parents didn't want me to hang out with them for a reason that I'm about to say is that their apartment, it was like one of these railroad apartments. The ABC um, No Real ABC Building. No Real Building. It was basically a shooting gallery. And I would be there with my, my cousins just running around and we'd just be like in, in the middle, in the mix of all these people with needles sticking out of their arms, out of their toes, like anywhere they could find veins, I remember them just like having needles sticking around and needles on the ground. And we're just like playing, you know, playing catch and hide and seek and all this stuff. So these things that I've seen that later on I, I realized like are, are things that kind of helped mold me because it, it was able to, to give me a different perspective and, and something that people would, would say, well, kids shouldn't be there, that's kind of like dangerous. That was, that was my playground. Got a big knock on my door about coming over about this famous guy is on Ludlow Street and you had to come and see him and take some pictures. And that was the Hellraiser boys. They were all um, on the corner of Stanton and Ludlow and all of a sudden I see this guy with a big afro and uh, in the middle of the, the crew and everybody really loved this guy. You were like the most famous guy in the hood at that time, around our area anyway, and it was like a big deal. So why don't you tell us about uh, your experience in Lorenzo? This is probably late 80s. Yeah, well, it was, it's, yeah, it's, it's up there. Um, basically, I used to rock my big afro back in the days, um, just like figuring out a way to like use my art and with poetry and, and with writing stories and always roaming the neighborhood and just like meeting different people. I was always neutral, like I, I never really like took any sides or so I was always able to like go to different neighborhoods and get accepted and everybody just, they, they thought that basically I was pretty bold, just kind of like I, I enjoyed wearing my fro, it wasn't at a time where everybody did that. It was probably during the time when people started either wearing braids or just they, they started like cutting their hair or whatever and I was just there just like you know I'm gonna rock it like this because this is my expression this is how I want to be and I think I got respect that way and um and it turns out that a lot of photographers and um and promoters would actually ask me to be involved in their projects and at a, 
around age like I was about 14, 15, I, I started going into the clubs because they allowed me to, to go, go into the clubs. And I was there at an early age. I remember going to like, um, let's see, like, I think it was Gasseteria, um, I think it was um, uh, Mud Club. Mud Club, like, yeah, yeah. like CBGBs. Like I, like, I was into like hip hop, but then I was into like the, the punk rock scene. and. I was into like the freestyle scene, so I was into everything. So I was just like be able to like blend in with different people. And so you kind of picked up on the physical fitness uh, thing. And then Power, of course, has been doing the physical fitness thing for a long time. But you're like the guy who runs a club, right? You want to tell us a bit about your well, group? I started as a group. I started. I started running uh, and sort of put together um, the run crew in 2004. But my, I never ran in high school, I never ran in junior high, no school running. But I was a runner because I was kind of a, a track star okay. in the 80s, but it was the train tracks. And I used to be running on the tracks, doing graffiti, running from cops, running from other riders, running from work bumps. So that's how I started really the run part because what a lot of people um, know about graffiti, if you did graffiti, is one of the best parts was at the end getting chased and obviously getting away. And that extra adrenaline that you got from the get over made that the night all the more better. So you um, became quite famous in graffiti writers. I was, you know, I was the famous neighborhood graffiti guy. You know, I did trains. I traveled a lot to Brooklyn and knew a lot of these were lower and, you know, the Bronx. You know, that was a subway day. So you would, you know, not too many trains were parked on the Lower East Side. You know, we'd run at night because it's a social thing and we're going to get together. And, get the crew together and go eat some Chinese food or you know, have drinks. So it's more of a social thing. And that's the difference between like when the first generation of it was gangs, like the Black Spades, right? And that turned into Zulu Nation, which became different crews and chap chapters like Rock Steady Crew and all that stuff. And then even though New York kind of fell into this gang thing again with, you know, Bloods and Crips and whatever else, we took it, the running movement took it as we are run crews, we're not run clubs, we're not kind of run games, but we're not too violent, right? We love each other, we like. It's funny, like, we wear uh, the color, we wear the colors of other crews. Like, so sometimes crews, right, with graffiti crews, uh, as a graffiti writer, you get, you get down with 10 different crews and you sort of promote all of them. With gangs, you were down with one gang, and one gang, and that was it, right? You couldn't wear the, the, the flying cut sleeves, the cut sleeves in the wrong neighborhood, right? right. Well, running crews, we all wear each other's stuff, so it'd be Copenhagen, London, Paris, France, like it's kind of more along the graffiti thing of like, okay, like we're all we're all one and that's the bridge to gap. So we kind of like bring back that community feel. But what you have on the Lower East Side when you have punk rock kids get together with, you know, hip hop kids and hardcore kids and everybody sort of, you know, hanging and kind of like living, you know, the Jamaicans, the West Indians came in and so it's kind of this one melting pot community. That's what what uh, bridge the gap. So when I met you, it was like you know you you the the guy that was allowed. I don't I don't know anybody who was really allowed into these like families where they allow you to take pictures and stuff. And you were that guy, and I was like, man, people respect this guy, and he's able to go into these places. It must be something about him. So then I started doing some research on you, and I saw like you were a real like integral part of the neighborhood because you basically kept the fabric alive by doing your photography and and, and keeping that history, so that we're able to stand here today and speak about it as the neighborhood is changing so well, much. Well, you were part of uh, MTV by that time, right? Oh, yeah. Then, um, so so as my as my career started taking off, it was basically I started using the leverage to get into like shows like MTV where they had uh, an opportunity to do a sketch comedy show called The Lyricist Lounge Show, and then I was able to be one of the creators of that by creating a sketch show with a couple of other MCs, and we, pre we pretty much um, developed this like formula to do sketches and rhymes and that was the formula used for the Lyricist Lounge show on MTV and that allowed me to get into the homes of millions of people who normally wouldn't listen to hip-hop music and so from that even a little before that I was known as the video king where I would be like in almost everybody's video it became like this thing where if this kid is not in the video then it's not an official video and I was in so many videos that the roots actually created a little slogan in the video, what they do, and, and the slogan said, 
how does this guy get in everybody's video? And from there, everybody was like, yeah, that is that kid. And with the baby face and whatever. So, so I noticed like, all these kids in the picture, and I noticed one of the kid in the middle has like a gun, looks like a 38 special. Mm -hmm. And then I guess this guy on the right doesn't look like he's in that crew. He must have been walking his dog with a girl or something. All right, what's the story with these people? Uh, okay, actually, this was, uh, you're right, this was uh, Tashi. Tashi at that point was taking over for uh, HR and uh, heading the Bad Brands. So he was going to be the new Bad Brand singer. So he came by, and of course, he wanted to make everybody in the neighborhood famous. So I hooked him up with, uh, with the crew here. And this would be like uh, Power was saying, the, uh, the Rainbow Posby, you know, kind of like the Attorney Boys, the Ridge Boys, turned into Dog Pound and like that. And at that time, um, who do you recognize in this? The Rainbow Posse? Yeah, there's a couple of guys in there from, from Rainbow Crew. So tell us about Rainbow. Oh yeah, Rainbow, well basically it's like at that time, you know, it was like when, you know, crack was very famous, you know, so you'd have people from different crews, different neighborhoods and stuff. So the Rainbow Posse is like different color vibes. So that's what, you know, what. All right, here's a cross-section of uh, what the front door photos look like. We tried to incorporate everybody. Uh, this was Taxi. Uh, he came from, uh, originally from Harlem. His uh, parents lived in Strivers Road. They called him Taxi because his whole thing downtown was delivering drugs. You can see he did a lot of shooting and stuff like that. Interesting guy, nice guy. He eventually cleaned himself up and got straight and survived. He uh, survived the cut because AIDS at that time was really brutal and wiped out a lot of people. This is probably 1986. The Bangladeshis, of course. Uh, this is Nizim. He ended up uh, running a store. He's a uh, local businessman from Lower East Side, doing really well. The rest of the guys are all doing good. So your, your front door became like the social media, like before social media, before Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that. Clayton, his front door was that for everybody. People would like go there and recognize people that they hadn't seen in years, long lost family members, like whatever. And so everybody wanted to get their picture taken because chances are somebody would recognize them and maybe they could reconnect. You know, so that, that's, you, you like the, the genius behind all the social media stuff, and they give you your props, bro. There you go. You need to get paid. There you go. We need to get paid. But from a neighborhood perspective, you're right. It was, yeah. like, it was a form of social media. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Exactly. Because you got people from different, like, blocks. The whole neighborhood. That yeah. able to, like, look and be like, oh, yeah, I know that person. And then it's a, it's a social thing, because we yeah. are talking about different stories. Like, yeah, I know that person.